I'm so excited. April's letting me do the intro. What do I say? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. You have to do it. Okay. At the end of part two, April finished sheathing the roof. So stay tuned as my daughter, who I couldn't be more proud of, continues building her 3,000 square foot shop. She's something, isn't she? <laughs> You're going to put me out of a job, Mama. <laughs> okay. Part three, here we go. Let's jump right in because I have a lot of ground to cover. Since I ended part two on sheathing, let's start with drip edge. I first applied drip edge to both eaves of the building. The rake drip edge is applied after the felt paper goes down. On the corners, I used a pair of tin snips to make a slice in the material, which allows the metal to make a corner bend. Next was paper. Instead of using traditional organic felt paper, I used a synthetic paper instead. It is more costly, but reading about the added benefits seems worth it to me. I started off laying the paper by myself, which was doable, but very slow. The next day, Cody was able to give me a hand and we were able to very quickly knock it out. He was able to roll out about an eight foot section while I used a slap stapler to attach it. While I was finishing stapling the top, he would start setting up the next section. After applying the rake drip edge, I then started laying down the shingles. We intentionally kept the sky track until the roofing material was delivered so that it could be used to set the material up on the roof. And boy, was that delivery guy happy he didn't have to use a pallet jack to unload the material from the truck. <laughs> Cody used the sky track to lift each bundle up one by one. And since the east side is the only accessible side for the sky track, that is where all the bundles were placed, making sure that they were set on top of the columns of the covered patio. We did try and get a bundle higher up closer to the ridge, but the slope was too much for the machine to overcome. This meant I started my shingling on the west side. I would carry two or three panels from the east to the west, set them down, and then start attaching them one by one. My mom came over to give me a hand installing this side. She has never been up on a roof before, and while she didn't think she'd have an issue with it, it turns out she didn't much care for it. She says she's not afraid of height, she's afraid of pitch. But not wanting to leave me alone, she would help me carry a few panels to the ridge and then sit and pass panels down to me, or screws or water. It was pretty nice, actually. <laughs> This is my third roof to install, and besides framing, it is definitely my favorite step. It is hard work, but I just love being able to see the process of the dramatic change that it creates. Next day, Cody was free to help me out, so he relieved my mom. Starting on the eve, Cody would insert a foam closure strip as I laid down a panel. Once the overhang on both sides was established, I would secure it with the first row of screws, then grab the next panel. I'm using a new product called 6B, and it's made by the same company who made the Ondevilla roof I installed on my last shop. The big difference is the panels are much larger, making it faster and easier to cover more ground. It's made to look like a metal roof, but is actually an asphalt-infused product. Screws need to be placed every two feet on these panels, and instead of pulling a chalk line after all the panels were in place, I pulled a chalk line on the top panel in the pile, then used a screw to go through about 12 panels at a time. This made it so that when a panel was set into place and lined up, I just had to throw a screw in my already marked location. With two people on the roof, the system became Cody would bring in a new panel. I would line up the left to the previous shingle, then use a spacer to place the right side. At this point, I would only secure the bottom of the panel. Once an entire row was laid down, then I would go back and do all of the intermediate screwing. When the bundles of shingles needed to be moved to lay down the next row, we spread them out in groups of about five across the entire roof line and picked from whichever pile was closest. When I made it to the pitch break, I cut the panel shorter for that row. The next row came in right on top, but I decreased the headlap just slightly in order to float in that transition nicely. With two people working, four rows could easily be done in a day. So while it was still a lot of hard work, it did go fast. On the rakes, instead of trying to cut a panel flush before laying it in place, I ended up letting it just run wild off the side, then using a chalk line and box blade to cut it flush after it was in place. A hook blade worked best here. Once getting to the ridge vent, a three foot strip of flashing is placed on each gable end to seal it up so that wind can't blow rain into the building. After the flashing process, another set of closure strips are placed, then finally a ridge cap. After a full day of roofing, one's leg does turn into quite the sticker collector. 
I actually forgot to do a flyover after completing the roof, but you can see it here in a shot after the wall sheathing was put on, which is the next step. The wall sheathing starts on the corner where we started the framing. So we started on the northwest corner. Is that north? And I was actually really surprised at how quickly the step went. Our system would be George would grab a sheet of OSB while I wedged two flat bars into the bottom plate. This would give him a ledge to set the sheet on. After making sure that it was plumb, I would stick the left side while George stuck the right. He would go and grab the next sheet while I did the rest of the intermediate nailing. Hammered in the two nails as spacers between sheets and moved the flat bars. I, I guess I should mention George came back <laughs> from Wisconsin. The reason George is here is because he's writing written content for the Family Handyman, the magazine, about constructing a building. So he's using my building as a way to generate the content and then I'm lucky enough to get experienced help for this project. One tip a contractor friend gave me that I really liked was to apply a strip of house wrap to the base plate before installing the OSB. This will later be folded up wrapping the bottom side of the OSB and creating a barrier so that it can't get wet. This skirt was applied to all sides, even the covered patio side. Let's talk about the direction of OSB. You typically see the first row laid horizontally, but a contractor buddy of mine, and yes, I've made plenty of contractor friends since starting this building, told me that the main thing to be conscious of during this step is you want the seams of your siding to miss the seams of your OSB. Because if the OSB panel swells slightly, then you'll be able to see that in your siding. I want a four foot wainscoting around my entire building, which means I don't wanna place the first row of OSB horizontally since that seam would land at four feet. Instead, the first row went down vertical and the second row went down horizontal. And with 12 foot walls, that meant those sheets needed to be cut on the east or west side of the building. Woohoo for save time. <laughs> This means the only cutting needed was the pieces to make up the gable ends. And if you know the pitch of your roof, then it's actually very simple to calculate these cuts. Having a third person dedicated to cutting and passing up these pieces is certainly the way to go to move things along. For the windows and doors, we would throw up a full sheet covering the openings, then come back with a flush trim bit and a router or a blade and a sawzall and cut the OSB flush with the openings. We were not having the best weather this week, so we saved the covered patio portion for last. In case it rained, we would still be able to work. The only thing we did differently on this side was use a spacer instead of a flat bar along the bottom. You don't want the OSB in contact with the slab. Once we were ready to start applying the house wrap, that bottom skirt was folded up and attached to the front side of the OSB. We would then pop a chalk line along the top of the wall to follow, then started rolling out the house wrap. <sighs> I feel like there needs to be a dun dun dun, cause this step was awful. If we were working with a full nine foot roll of wrap, we would roll it out inside of the shop first, then cut it to length. We would use ladders and kind of leapfrog each other and play pass off until the entire top was stapled. I would then pull on the bottom while we did all of the intermediate stapling. For the top row, we actually cut the roll to size so that we wouldn't have so much waste and also to allow us to keep it on the roll while attaching it. The east and west side weren't all that bad although they weren't all that great either. But the gable ends were where it got almost comical since it added scaffolding and extension ladders to the operation. The words awkward and awful come to mind. But we got the entire building wrapped and called it done. Next up will be the windows. However, they were delayed by two weeks, so I'm having to take a short pause from the shop. It is simply amazing getting to this point though. We were able to move the job site into the woodworking space and no longer have to throw a tarp on everything at night. The miter saw, job site, and circular saw are all plugged in and ready to be used. With no lights yet, it's still pretty dark inside on an overcast day, but it won't be too much longer before this is a real functioning space. So I will see you next time as I continue on.